Grab some carrots. What? I said grab some carrots. What? Said he's an Irishman and the Negro is his war. <laughs> that is definitely not what I said because we have the fourth season of Fargo and there is so much to talk about. In this video, we'll be going over the ending of Fargo season four, as well as taking a deep dive into its meaning, that crazy post credit reveal, and much, much more. So sit on down with a nice slice of pie and make sure to like and subscribe because here we go. The final episode is called Storia Americana, or translated from Italian, American History. And it's no wonder it's called that, since both the very first and last episode start and end with Ethel Rita Smutney's history report of the strange events which occurred in Kansas City, Missouri from 1950 to 1951. My name is Ethel Rita Pearl Smutney. This is my history report. She questions who writes these history books, who chooses what to remember and what to leave out. Much of American history has been written by old white men, so it's only fitting this story is told from the lens of a young black woman. The final episode begins with a cavalcade of characters who have died throughout the season, truly showing just how bloody it's been. Donatello Fada, Paolo, Antoon, Calamita, Omi, Deffy, Otis, Dr. Senator, Swanee, Gaetano, and Rabbi Milligan. That's not even covering the characters that will die in this episode, but we'll get to that. By the park here, we have Lloyd Cannon, head of Cannon Limited, an African-American crime syndicate operating out of Kansas City, alongside Abel Violante, a man whose last name literally means violent. Lloyd is here to strike a deal with the Fada crime family after war broke out between his operation and the Italians. You might notice how it's summertime here, while most of the season and past seasons of Fargo have taken place during the winter. That's because production was halted during much of COVID-19 and episodes 10 and 11 hadn't been shot yet and were put on hold until proper safety measures were put in place. Last episode, Ethel Rita came to Loy and gave him something along with a proposal that would sway the gang war in Loy's favor. She came with a ring, and not just any ring, this is the ring that belonged to Donatello Fada, the former head of the Fada crime family who was killed by nurse Orietta Mayflower way back in episode one. She likes to collect mementos of her victims, and when Ethel Rita was cleaning her home, she stumbled upon her closet filled with various poisons, obituary clippings, and other knickknacks. Loy will use the ring to posit that Josto hired Orietta, the nurse whom he was having an affair with, to kill his father so he could take over the family. Meanwhile, Josto isn't doing so well, drinking himself silly over the death of his brother who died last episode, Gaetano. It's kind of ironic considering for most of the season Josto was trying to kill him. You'll notice Josto is framed against an 1880 painting called The Storm by French artist Pierre Cotte. It features a man and a woman seeking refuge from a storm, and I can't help but find this imagery similar to him and Orietta near the end of the episode. Storms also feature heavily throughout the season, a metaphor for being unable to control things. You used to think that you can control things. That's why God created tornadoes, to remind us. Just like the tornado that sucks up Calamita and Rabbi Milligan in episode 9. The season, like ones before it, feature moments that are so absurd it can only be described as a twist of fate. Like when Gaetano trips and accidentally shoots himself. Or when a kid's pea shooter ends up putting the head of the Fada family in hospital. Orietta, who I found to be the most interesting character of the season, has found herself in prison, having been arrested for the attempted murder of Dr. Harvard after she poisoned one of his macaroons. She'll later be released on bail and taken to the Fadas, but more on that in a bit. The mule, Loy's son, hands over the keys to the Smutney's house. Loy had taken over the house, which also operates as a mortuary business, after the family took a loan from him that they couldn't pay back. But with Ethel Rita's delivery of the ring to Loy, it seems all their debts are forgiven, and now things can finally go back to normal. Josto, however, is still filled with rage, and decides to take matters into his own hands and assassinate those who have wronged him. This includes Dr. Harvard, who didn't allow his father to be treated at his hospital because because he was Italian, and the mayor. You might recall Josto was engaged to the mayor's daughter as part of a business deal, a deal that was cancelled after the mayor's connection to Josto and the gang war became too heated. Josto is informed that Loy has been killed, but that's a lie. He's confronted by Abel who has brought along Orietta. They believe Josto hired Orietta to kill his father, and Orietta says it's true. He told her to quote, take care of him, but she took that to mean, you know, kill him. You kill your father so you can wear the crown. Then you kill your brother, so you don't have to share. 
Across the city, Loy's men end up killing Lionel Halloway, who last episode was going to double cross Loy to take control of the cannon business in Kansas City. For now, it seems like everything is going well for Loy. He's made peace with the Italians and taken care of his rival, Lionel, but there's one person he hasn't made peace with, and that's going to end up costing him. Josto and Orietta are taken to a secluded field to be killed, and it's kind of fitting that Orietta's last request is to be shot second so she can watch Josto be killed. She has a kink for death and relishes watching Josto die even though her end is mere moments away. I love this shot from episode 7 which frames Orietta as an angel of death. It's also worth noting this shot of Orietta's disfigured reflection. Even though she puts on lipstick before her death, it won't hide how ugly her soul is. And how many of you discovered the faint image of the ghost that haunted the Smutneys beside her here? In episode 10, we learn this person was called Theodore Roach, the captain of a slave ship that brought Ethelreda's great-grandfather over from Africa. He's a man with a wooden nose, eyes sewn shut, who Ethelreda's mother calls the devil himself. He was killed by Ethelreda's great-grandfather, and now he haunts the family to this day. But this image of him next to Orietta seems to hint that he's latched onto something new, something with great evil, Orietta herself. So I like to think the Smutneys are no longer haunted by this ghostly entity. You may also have noticed the person who ends up killing Josto and Orietta as a young Joe Bulo, who featured prominently in Season 2, played by Brad Garrett. He'll later go on to be the frontman for the northern expansion of the Kansas City Crime Syndicate. With everything seemingly right in the world, Loy comes home to find his front door ajar. Fearing it could be someone trying to harm him or his family, he goes in alone to find a bowl of cereal, his missing son Satchel's favorite food, and his red baseball cap. Satchel has come home and the two are reunited. In Episode 6, Rabbi Milligan saves Satchel from being killed and the two go on the run. Unlike himself, he wants Satchel to have a choice what happens to him in his life. He wants him to be able to choose between going back to his family, one filled with crime, and being on his own. I never got to choose. A child soldier, that's what they made me. But that's not gonna happen to you. Abel and Loy agree that all is forgiven between the two warring parties, but the Italians have made a new deal. Half of all Loy's businesses will belong to them. And Loy is in no position to argue. The Italians are a giant multi-city crime syndicate with enough power to crush Loy's small operation. Even if Abel were killed, another would just take his place. Loy arrives home after his meeting, proclaiming that the war is over. He looks at his family through the window and smiles. Even though he's lost most of his business, he has his his family back, which is the most important. You might even have caught Satchel reading How to Win Friends and Influence People, the same book which Hunk Swindell talked about in episode 9. How to win friends and influence people, six ways to make people like you. Number one, become genuinely interested in other people. The tragedy here is just when Loy has everything right, he's viciously stabbed by Zelmar, the woman he turned into the police, which resulted in her lover Swanee being killed. It's Satchel who ends up discovering his father as he dies right in front of him. You may have also noticed the oranges scattered about. Oranges were what Loy's men used to smuggle guns from across the country, and orange is also the hue of the executioner in the painting, Summary Execution Under the Moorish Kings of Granada, which features prominently both in episode episode 10 and the final shot of the season. The executioner has been killed and having Ethelreda framed behind this picture suggests this might not be the last time we see her character. Speaking of that final shot, we see Ethelreda reciting her history report as she leaves carrying two suitcases. I like to believe this is her going off to college, but it's open to interpretation. And I hope you stayed for the post credit sequence with the big reveal that Satchel is season 2's Mike Milligan all grown up. Basically the entire season has been a backstory for this character, informing us how Mike came to be. We see he took the last name Milligan after the man who saved his life. And if you remember from season two, Mike's character was very charismatic and talkative, quite different from the satchel we saw in the show. However, we do see this change when he starts reading How to Win Friends and Influence People. He's on his journey to becoming Mike. Witnessing his father's death and knowing what his father did undoubtedly guided his decision to become an enforcer for the Kansas City mob. It's ironic that even though Rabbi by Milligan gave him the choice to do whatever he wants with his life, he still chose to go back to his family and live this life of crime. And it really begs the question, are our choices our own, or are we bound to twisted acts of fate which the show so devilishly likes to show us? The show also deals with the idea of power. Almost every character in this season strives for it. Josto is arguably the most powerful, yet likes to be powerless in his sexual encounters with Orietta. Loy believes having more power will keep his family safe, but it ends up doing the exact opposite. 
it. He'd even trade his own son for more. I traded my own son to my enemy for power. Otis becomes a cop believing its power will save him, but he ends up having to make deals with criminals in order to feel safe. All I know is I, I feel better when I'm in charge, when I got the power. Orietta loves the power of being able to take a life, since as a child she had no power over her own. Growing up powerless in the hospital, her mother having to exchange sexual favors with doctors just in order for her to get the right care. But power in Fargo Season 4 is inextricably linked to race. The Italians, Irish, and Cannon families, for example, turn to crime because at every turn they are shunned by the already established quote-unquote white people. They can't climb the social or economic ladder because they are not deemed equal. And here's what you need to know about the people in that room. None of them were white. All fighting for the rights have been created equal. Orietta, Dr. Harvard, and Deffy are prime examples of white people whose privilege gives them authority and power over others. What does it feel like to be so sure you're right and know that nobody cares? As showrunner Noah Hawley told The Hollywood Reporter, this story of Satchel is the story of America, a black man raised by an Irish American who himself was raised by a Jewish family and then an Italian family. No wonder the last episode is called American History. Thanks for watching everyone, if you liked the video be sure to give it a like and subscribe and share, and for more bad takes you can always follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time remember, Daddy loves you very much.